I don't plan to stay here long. One way or another, this place won't hold me. Yeah, sure, I know they all say that. But trust me, I'm different. No, that's not right. I'm probably dog standard. But the circumstances are different. And the circumstances are going to make things a little difficult. Unless I tell someone. Even if I tell someone. Since I was a little boy, I've had a problem. The doctors call it kleptomania. To me, it's a challenge. Not a challenge like the kind you see at a big budget blockbusters, but the one where the suave gentleman spy gets the girl, a fortune, and the respect of the people he's stolen from. It's a challenge to rein myself in. A challenge to keep myself from taking something. Anything. And a challenge I always inevitably lose. First memory I have, when I was six, my parents were in a store, a restaurant or something. There was a bunch of pastries, fresh and flaky, and delicious behind the counter, glazed with honey and chocolate, and maple syrup that looked like it had been taken from a broken, unresisting tree. The server was a nice lady. She saw my smile and the innocent look in my blue eyes, and I remember her saying, from rosy red lipstick that she couldn't hide the night's bruises that she wanted to give me a little extra gift for free. And while she and my parents were talking, I held myself to several from inside the display, shoving them crudely into my pockets. I never ate them. I just felt nervous, nauseous, and thrilled. Somehow, my parents never found out. They found out much later, and my father got so angry that his face swelled up like a big balloon. He yelled and shouted to himself, telling me to never steal again. Yeah, you're right, it's not important now. Even if I'd wanted to, I couldn't. Guess self-control's pretty crap, huh? <laughs> I'm just joking with myself, that's why I'm laughing. Over time, I moved out, and on with my life. I got a good car, a good job, but my habits never changed. I moved from stealing odd trickings from school and work to walking around town finding houses that people lived in. I'd wait outside, sometimes days, sometimes weeks, watching them, figuring out when they were going to leave. And I would bide my time, fighting the impulse until it was screaming in my ear, and then I'd get into my mark and take something. It didn't matter what, maybe a piece of jewelry, maybe a book fallen from the shelf, I tried to avoid valuable things that looked like they'd be easily noticed or have sentimental value. I just needed proof. Something that I could shove in a drawer and mark as a sign that I'd been there. And then, my little secret wouldn't try to tempt at coming back at me again. It'd be over and under control. For at least a little while. They don't tell you that it means living alone. That it means avoiding other people but being charming enough that people will think everything is alright. Sure, I could have talked to a doctor about my problems. <sighs> Maybe that would have even helped. With words or drugs or medicine or something. But my voice whispered to me, and foremost, it was seductive. All I needed to be was happy and live. But there was this one house that never really called to me. It had been old. Renovated a few times. Failed to sell on the market. The young couple moved in. Looking like they had too much money and not enough common sense. With them, they brought their little daughter. Not even a year old. I watched them go out, eating at fancy restaurants at least once or twice a week. The new car they bought was lavished and red. And one day, they left that fancy car to catch for a show and I slipped inside and unlocked the front door the moments they'd left. My blood felt like it was on fire, and it felt like ice at the same time. The house was very organized. Imitation vases with plastic flowers, silverware and tablecloths and paintings that looked like they were too good to be true. My slip-on shoes didn't make any sound as my field of vision took in everything around me. 
looking for what I could take. It took me a while to process the crying sound. It was coming from down the hallway, and it was then I realized they left their kid home. All alone. My palms scraped against my khakis, and I couldn't even feel the surface of my skin. Itchy. No, I didn't plan to steal the kid. I know what you've probably read in the papers, but they must have said. I don't care if you believe me or not, but if I don't tell someone... Well, at first, I avoided the hallway to her room. I tried looking upstairs, hoping I could just take an earring or something and call it a day. Nothing stood out in the master bedroom. In the second bedroom, in some room, it looked like a cross between a study and a rec room for someone who never grew up, filled with car models and paper airplanes. But nothing spoke to me, said the Velvet Whisperer. I wanted to be taken away and taken home, so that I could lock it in a little shelf with a padlock and a murmur and a promise he'd be safe and a slave to the call. I made my way to the first room down the hall. The crying had stopped when I had made my way to the hallway. I'd gotten a little sloppy due to my unease, and I could hear my footsteps against the tiled floor of the kitchen as I passed it by. The first room on the right had a child's mobile, but otherwise seemed to be another study room, with a modern computer and office chair sitting. At least that was my initial thought. As I stepped inside, I nearly tripped over the almost camouflaged cradle that was set up in the center of the room, looking up at me with huge, innocent eyes. The couple's kid grinned at me and cooed. I tried to ignore her as I stumbled around the room, once again trying to mask my steps. Drawers full of paper and reports greeted me. Not anything interesting enough to take. At least not without spending too far long to read through them to be safe. Then I realized two things. Though I'd once again ceased making any noise when I moved, there were footsteps. Steps that fell a few moments after mine, and stopped abruptly when I did. Secondly, she was crying again, crying hard and harshly, flailing against the walls of her cradle. <laughs> Man, I'm not lying when I said I nearly fell over myself in fright and shock. I managed to wheel around while my brain was grasping at straws, looking for some sort of excuse that sounded remotely plausible. They all vanished like grains of sand between my lips. When my eyes met his, he stood maybe a few inches shorter than me, not too skinny, not too fat, chalky-toned, glassy-eyed, in a floral print shirt that seemed to be too cold for the crisp weather. He seemed as surprised to see me as I was to see him. Then he opened his mouth and smiled amicably, grabbing me by the shoulder. I could feel the crush of my shoulder popping from its socket as he twisted me around, more easily than any human should be able to do. His fingers felt like unrisen dough with sculptures of clay, and then I fell to the ground, whimpering like an idiot for trying to fight back the pain. Strolling over the cradle, he reached forward and tenderly plucked the girl from where she has crawled to. Her tears had dried, but as much as an infant would, she was glowering him the recently dried eyes. And in that instant, in a brief instant, I saw his fingers flicker like swollen white plaster, and I knew that I had to do something. <sighs> Managing to pull myself from the door, I ran and dashed into him, knocking the stranger to the ground and catching the little girl as he collided into one of the many bureaus with an audible crunch. I could see a wound in the side of his head, but no blood flowed, and indeed, he didn't show much of sign of noticing. Only a mild surprise that slowly turned into a look of hatred and rage, pulling himself up to his shunty and unimpressive height, everything from above his waist, trailing behind him limp and uselessly. The stranger began to spasm uncontrollably, and I ran. 
I ran down the hallway carrying the little girl in my arms and terrified. I might lose her since one seemed to be responding to my desperate request and ran flying to ignore the voice of screaming that I hadn't taken anything yet and ran terrified that if the man or man-shaped thing caught up with me I would die. And then the tile bubbled beneath my feet and I tripped and fell. I managed to brace the infant against my still good left arm and use it to shield her body. But as the white go-like tar bubbled around my feet and surged back to the man, I knew I'd been caught. He made his way towards me slowly. Certainly, he didn't even try to move normally anymore. Feet wide apart, like he was riding a horse through the air. And the pallid substance grew, shaped itself back into limbs, in the places his arms should be. He fell completely to his back, and began to run over the floor like some sort of humanoid dog, panting, with his tongue half out, and his eyes glistening in excitement. As he ran, his skin kind of glistened and slot off around him, white and bubbly and incandescent. And I knew we were both going to die. Or I would have, had I not heard the voice, triumphant and loud, whisper to me, only a few inches away. The little girl cooed in my hand, shout out, and I felt the cold steel of a lighter it flickered on as my fingers braced around it. The pale light brought the creature to a roll-looking stop. In its confusion, I managed to get on my feet, I ran towards it screaming, then I kicked the damn thing until it stopped moving. Obviously, alive and paralyzed, more out of surprise than actual damage. Then I set the house on fire, not leaving until it saw the smoke and fire caused that thing to shrivel up and go limp and dissipate into the floorboards and tiles. Then, I joined the little girl, where I'd place her outside. I found myself, found by the police. I told them what I told the courts, that I'd been planning to kidnap the girl. And the house burned down because of my own damn carelessness. It's close enough to the truth, and close enough to make me regret nothing. I haven't had a huge urge to take anything here. Not at all. Not anymore. The voice seems satisfied with my role, or the role I had to play, but I had to tell someone, to tell you, pal, because in my dreams, I see those eyes, green and multifactated, before they grow human again for a few moments, and I know that I didn't kill it, <laughs> whatever it was, oh, I heard it, but it's under the earth somewhere, under the ruins of that burnt-out husk of a house. And it'll come back when they rebuild the place, or maybe it'll just move somewhere else, I don't know. But first, it'll find me here and kill me. Probably gonna make it look like I killed myself, or someone else did it. And that's why you have to know. Because I'm going to beat it to the punch. Just to put the dreams to an end. Just do me a favor, alright? Find a way to give this back to that family. To her. I'm sure they'll use the insurance to move somewhere else. Somewhere new. <laughs> and that thing follows them. If it follows them. I want her to have my lighter. I don't know how good it will work. I don't even know if it will work. But it's all I can do. <laughs>